Welcome to the 2023 BGSU Public and Allied Health Symposium. This is the 23rd edition. Uh, gets bigger and better every year. We've got a great keynote speaker today, the Ned Baker keynote address by Dr. Laura Wilkin. Um, I am here to provide the logistics for the day. My name is Phil Welch, and um, if you're a BGSU alum, welcome home. Your academic home, so to speak, but good to see everyone here. So silence your cell phones. That's number one, right? Bathrooms are located out the door and to the right. The nearest unisex bathroom is basically right below us. So if you go out the door and go down the steps, you can find a unisex bathroom down on the first level. Here's our agenda. Keynote until 12.15. Then we'll do lunch, and the lunches will be at the back of the room, and it's color-coded. We came up with a very intricate color-coding system. So you gotta look at your name tag, and I believe yellow is turkey, and so on and so forth. It's, it'll be labeled at the back of the room there, so at 12.15 you can go pick up your lunch, and then we'll do awards at 12.45, and then the panel will begin at one. And then we'll wrap up by two o'clock. I think I've covered everything here. I'd like to thank the uh, planning committee for all their work, Carol and Amanda and Wen and Sharon Schaefer and Kaylee Perry, our GA. Excellent work. These things don't just happen. It takes a lot of planning. Um, but about 10 years ago, we had 40 people. Today, we have over 400. So it's um, going well, and it, it uh, takes a lot of work and effort on these people's parts, so thank you very much. We also have good co-sponsors that help us fund this event, um, so thank you to the Center for Violence Prevention and Education, the Graduate College, University Library, and the Center for Women, Women and Gender Equity, and it's also National Public Health Week, so welcome for National Public Health Week, and it's also the Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month. So the topic is perfect for that. So we're here to do our part today in preventing and being more aware of sexual assault and uh, human trafficking in particular. So I'm gonna hand it over. Without any further ado, please welcome to the stage our Dean of the College of Health and Human Services, Dr. Jim Cisla. Thanks so much, Phil, and thank you all uh, that were uh, part of planning this convening. Um, the Baker Lecture's 23-year tradition in the College of Health and Human Services and at BGSU, so it's well part of the culture. We have a long history of addressing important topics to society, and today's certainly a, a continuance of that. The Ned E. Baker Lecture on Public Health was established in 1999 to honor Baker's many contributions to the field of public health. Ned Baker received his Bachelor of Arts degree in 1950 from the Bowling Green State University and a Master of Public Health degree in 1954 from the University of Michigan. In, in December 2009, he was presented an honorary Doctor of Science in Public Health degree by BGSU from the College of Health and Human Services. And in April 2010, he was named one of BGSU's most prominent alumni. Thank you, Ned, for continuing to support the symposium your support is always appreciated. We also want to remember and thank the late Ted Pratt and his widow for their continued support through the Cove Trust for the, for the, uh, the symposium itself. Now I'd like to introduce the 12th president of BGSU, Dr. Rodney Rogers, to the podium. If I can go wherever. I'm going backwards here. This technology is a little beyond me. Here we go. And there we have, there we are, thanks. Okay, got it. Thank you and good, uh, oh yeah, that does look like me. Don't you think though, uh, if it works, it uh, doesn't matter. Uh, I was going to make some reference to uh, our hair difference, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, so uh, 23rd Annual uh, Public and Allied Health Symposium at Bowling Green State University, and I think we have over 400 individuals 
registered, and we, we also know we're streaming this uh, to additional audiences. And, you know, I, I just want to say um, each year this event, certainly during uh, the pandemic, and I'm going off script here a little bit, I know, but um, during the pandemic, we certainly understood the importance of public health and bringing communities together, finding ways forward. And so I want to start by uh, thanking all of our individuals that are here today that are actively working in public health and supporting our communities in a lot of different ways. And so um, each of you, I just know how much we appreciate all the work that you have done over uh, some very challenging years. And now um, as we move forward as communities and as a society, you've become incredibly important in, in ensuring the vitality and the health of our community. So thank you very much for the work you do. Please, a round of applause for them. I certainly also want to thank uh, the College of Health and Human Services and, and the great faculty in our public health and allied health areas, um, BGSU Graduate College, University Libraries, the Center for Violence Prevention Education, as well as the Center for Women and Gender Equity. Um, uh, all uh, important programming, and we've got uh, many of those individuals that work in those fields uh, or in those areas are here today, so thank you for your work. and. Every, everybody else in, in terms of the planning and uh, uh, bringing this group together. I think, is this the largest we've ever had? Okay, in the ball. Uh, well, I'm going to claim it. It's the largest we've ever had, okay? Almost. Uh, maybe last year was uh, maybe a little bit bigger, but clearly uh, a great turnout. And it, and it speaks to... Uh, the topic certainly today, uh, but the importance of public health. And I also want to make sure that I acknowledge uh, Ned Baker, uh, distinguished career and uh, honorary from Bowling Green. So Dr. Baker, I want to make sure that uh, we thank him for his leadership in a variety of ways around public health. Um, you know, this year um, we are um, uh, very pleased to uh, have our uh, keynote speaker, uh, who is also a BGSU alumna and also a faculty member at Bowling Green State University, Dr. Laura Wilkin. And uh, Dr. Wilkin is an assistant clinical professor at Bowling Green State University and a program coordinator for our R online RN to BSN program. Her background, certainly in nursing, is primarily medical su surgical oncology. Uh, but she has experience, deep experience in public school nursing as well as being a sane nursing. Uh, she is, has a passion for educating healthcare providers about human trafficking. Uh, and as you know, Ohio ranks in the, in the top five in the nation in, in terms of human trafficking as reported by the National Human Trafficking Hotline. Um, uh, we know work is happening across our state on multiple levels of government, healthcare, higher education, law enforcement to improve this situation. And, and a lot of that work is being led by BGSU's own Dr. Wilkin. And uh, Dr. Wilkin is the chair of the Ohio Attorney General's Human Trafficking Public Awareness Subcommittee. And she's working to, uh, her and her committee, and many others, uh, are working to raise awareness about human trafficking across the, the state of Ohio uh, in a variety of healthcare and community settings to make sure that uh, providers receive appropriate evidence-based education and um, uh, we're able to gather evidence and, and help survivors. Um, I also note Dr. Wilkin recently earned her Doctor of Nursing Practice and uh, has an incredible personal story about the power of education. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to uh, present our keynote speaker, Dr. Laura Wilkin. President Rogers for that very thoughtful introduction and <laughs> I 
many thanks to those of you who are attending today. You can see a little bit of raw emotion in my face because when I look out at the landscape of all of the people that are here, I see hope. I see possibility. And so, you know, I wanted to take a moment to, to touch on what President Rogers just concluded with. GED to DNP. Looking at me, that's something that you probably wouldn't imagine, consider, or, or even see. But each and every one of us has a picture that no one sees. And it is my sincere hope that by the conclusion of this presentation, each and every one of you will be able to see the possibility that you have and the impacts that you can make on human trafficking when viewing it through an interprofessional lens. When I shared my personal journey with you, I wanted to let you know that it was thanks to one person who took the time to invest in me. One person who never gave up on me, even when I had given up on myself and who continuously planted preventative seeds that I am now the person that you see. Each and every one of you in doing this meaningful work has the potential to plant a seed. And so before we begin, I do want to provide a disclaimer that this content is very sensitive in nature. So if at any time during this presentation you feel as though you are uncomfortable or you need to leave, you may absolutely do so, returning only when it's best for you. And for our BGSU students, we did let the Counseling Center know that this was the topic we were covering. So they are available for you via phone should you need to speak with someone. And for all of our audience members, there are a wonderful wealth of national mental health hotlines should you need a safe space to talk with someone during or after the presentation. And if you do, we strongly encourage you to take that opportunity. So let us now begin looking at what our objectives are going to be. So for this presentation, we're going to start with defining what is human trafficking. We will then identify vulnerable populations who may be more susceptible. We will distinguish barriers to identification. Collaboratively, we are going to explore human trafficking as both a public health care crisis and as a social justice issue. Summarizing with the systematic shift that is absolutely essential for providing resources to assist those in need. Let us now begin with what is human trafficking? So human trafficking has been legally defined as the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for a commercial sex act or labor services. One of the things that really inspired me well over a decade ago to want to learn everything that I possibly could about human trafficking was the fact that we live in the United States, the land of the free. So how is it possible that throughout communities and neighborhoods across our country, human trafficking is occurring? How can this possibly be? Well, it's because of these three things, force, fraud, and coercion. So when we talk about force, we're talking about things like rape, beatings, constraint, drug addiction, and confinement. When we talk about fraud, we're talking about false promises of employment or an opportunity at a better life. And who doesn't want that, right? Coercion 
is threats of serious harm to or any physical restraint of any person via scheme or threatened abuse of the legal process. And when I think about these three things, a great example comes to mind. And it involves the story, the remarkable story, I might add, of a dear friend of mine named Harold de Sousa, survivor of labor trafficking and founder of Eyes Open International. You see, Harold, much like the rest of us, wanted an opportunity at a better life, but found himself and his family who were trafficked from India to Cincinnati, Ohio, found himself in a situation where upon arrival, his documentation was taken from him. In addition to his documentation being taken, his name was changed from Harold to illegal, and he and his family were forced into labor working in a restaurant. Harold's story, like so many others before him that remain untold, are a great reminder of why it is absolutely essential that we not only know the means of trafficking, but that we are also aware of the grooming process. So, you know, I shared my personal story with you in the beginning. I was a little emotional, but now I'm getting going. Um, I shared my, my personal story with you in the beginning because one of the things that you might not know about me is that I quit school when I was in the eighth grade. I moved to the city of Cleveland on my own, and I was in a really dark place in my life during that time. And when I reflect back on those experiences, I now realize that I was a kid who fit all of the criteria for being groomed. And one of the things that we're not talking enough about when it comes to human trafficking and that we need to be having the conversations about is that it's not like what you see in the social media and in the news. It's not like the movie Taken. Many a times it's the development of a relationship. It is the facilitation of a bond, a trauma bond that makes it so incredibly challenging for these people to leave. And you know, when I was in nursing school, I was taught to care for my patients based off of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Traffickers are so skilled in what they do, they have essentially developed their own hierarchy of needs on how they psychologically break a victim down and then exploit their vulnerabilities. So reflecting on my nursing experience, I was taught that I was to essentially meet their most basic physiological needs, ensuring that they had food, oxygen, water, all those things that are necessary for survival. When we think about traffickers and how they do this and what their strategy is, they may encounter a homeless individual or a runaway youth on the street. And then right away, this very nice person comes along and I have a nice place for you to stay somewhere warm for the night. And then understanding the fact that if this is a runaway youth, they're probably running away from a situation that wasn't good in the first place. So the trafficker is then going to offer safety and security. You don't have to worry about anything anymore. I'm going to be your protector. I'm going to take care of you. And then starts love and belonging. And when you think about love and belonging to a kid who's never had this before, that means absolutely everything. It means everything. I'm going to give you the family that you've never had. I'm going to show you the love that you've never received. And then next comes safety and security. Oh, we talked about that. Next comes self-esteem. So when we think about self-esteem, you know, they may take them out to get their hair done, to get their nails done, to buy them nice things. Did you know in the state of Ohio, it is required for cosmetologists to have human trafficking training, but it is not required for all public service workers, nor is it required for all healthcare workers. That's something collaboratively that we can change. That's why I say I see hope today. 
And then when we think about self-actualization, this to me is probably one of the most scariest things because of the fact that this is the promise of wealth or fame. You see, when I was a kid, you weren't going to be famous unless you were going to California. But with the invention of the internet, we have offered the opportunity for any child to believe that they can be insta-famous overnight. In addition to this, we've offered the opportunity for anyone to come into our homes at any given time via social media and online gaming. So when we are providing education on this topic, we need to not only provide it to our youth, but we need to be educating parents as well. And in addition to understanding the grooming process, we also need to know what is happening in our state. So, what is happening in Ohio? Toledo, Ohio has ranked in the top five in the United States for calls made to the National Human Trafficking Hotline. In the top five. And when I say this to people, they're always very shocked, very horrified. And they say, well, Toledo, Ohio, why? Well, when you think about the demographics of our state, Ohio has multiple tourist areas, so there's people coming and going. In addition to this, there's major events, and whenever you have a major event, you potentially have entertainment coming in. We also have easy access in and out of the state, so when you think about this, you can get in and out under two to three hours per se. And then we have a high incidence of homeless and runaway youth. But one of the things that people don't realize about this ranking is the fact that, yes, Toledo, Ohio is ranked in the top five. And while this may be shocking, when I look at this slide, I actually see hope. And the reason being is because what it actually states is that we are ranking in the top five because people in Toledo, Ohio understand what human trafficking is and they are identifying it. So what that means is that if more people like yourselves attended trainings like this and had a better understanding of what human trafficking was and were able to identify it, we would actually see these numbers begin to change. And that's why it is essential for us to not only know what is happening in our state, it's also essential for us to know where human trafficking is happening. So we can see from this slide here that human trafficking happens in hotels and massage parlors, right? Everyone here pretty aware of that? That's what's commonly seen in the media and the news. But for those of you who are in attendance today that are first responders, for those of you that are in attendance today that are social service workers, we may have some home health nurses here, human trafficking happens in homes. And largely, it's due to familial trafficking. And so it's important for us to know that parents and family members can be traffickers as well. And those of you who are going into homes, you can be frontline identifiers. We also can see here that human trafficking happens in truck stops. It happens in convenience stores. It happens in gas stations. We know from Harold's story that it happens in restaurants. It can happen in nail salons. And we can see here that it happens on farms. So not to put you on the spot or anything, but how many of you in this room, please, by a show of hands, are aware of the Trillium case? We have a few, and they happen to all be my close colleagues and friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so the reason why I ask you this is because if you Google labor trafficking, and Ohio egg case farms, you would be surprised to know that just a couple counties away, that there were teens being trafficked from Guatemala to Marion County, Ohio, where they were forced into labor, required to live in deplorable conditions for little to no pay with threats of serious harm to their family. How many times do you drive by a farm and think to yourself, hmm, I wonder if human trafficking is occurring there? It is so incredibly important for us to know 
sanitarians who may be going and inspecting farms, you could be frontline identifiers. And when you look at the map here that is provided by the Polaris Project, home of the National Human Trafficking Hotline, we can see that human trafficking happens everywhere and it can happen anywhere, which was why it is so essential reflecting back on that grooming process that we are aware that malls and libraries serve as a great place for the facilitation of that grooming process and the introduction and development of a relationship, which is one of the most common entry points into human trafficking. So not only do we need to know where human trafficking happens, it's essential that we also know who is it happening to. Anyone can be a victim of human trafficking, but those who are at highest risk are some of our most vulnerable populations. So when we're looking at this slide here, when we think of children, for those of you again who are social workers, some of our most vulnerable youth are our foster youth. These kids may already view themselves as a commodity because they know that a check is being exchanged for them to have a place to stay. In addition to this, what are the homes that they're being placed into? When we think about vulnerable women, just think about that mother who just needs enough money to put a roof over her head or to feed her kids. We've talked a little bit already about homeless and runaway youth as well as immigrants. Other populations who are at very high risk are our disabled because of the fact that they have cognitive and physical disabilities. This places them at very high risk. Also, thinking about our LGBTQ plus community, these individuals may not have received the love and acceptance that they so rightfully deserve from their community, and a trafficker knowing this will swoop in, fulfill that need, and then exploit those vulnerabilities. And then when we think about drug addicts, same kind of thing. Traffickers understand that there is a need for the drug, and what they will do is they will fulfill that need and then they will exploit the individual using that against them. And then lastly, most importantly, we hear time and time again that girls and women are often victims of human trafficking, but anyone, anyone can be a victim. In fact, you will see here that the U.S. Institute Against Human Trafficking just released that new studies show that up to 36% of sex trafficked children in the U.S. are biologically born males. Now I'm very careful about sharing statistics in my presentations, and I'll tell you why. Because when we look at this statistic here, it doesn't tell us about individuals who are labor trafficked. It doesn't tell us about those who identify otherwise. But what it does tell us is that human trafficking doesn't discriminate. It doesn't discriminate when it comes to its victims, nor does it discriminate when it comes to its traffickers. So, who are the traffickers? Well, the first thing that I want you to consider is if you were walking down the street and you encountered one of these individuals, they probably wouldn't seem that suspecting, would they? For example, let's take the young girl here in the orange jumpsuit. Does she look like she would be a trafficker? No, as a matter of fact, she looks like she might be one of the victims. But in all reality, both she and these two men took a teenager drugged her, assaulted her, and then trafficked her from Kentucky to Cincinnati, Ohio, where she was recovered. As hard as that is to process, let's remember again, in Cincinnati, Ohio was where she was recovered. Also, another thing that you'll see here when you're looking at these individuals is a common theme. And that theme is many of them hold a position of trust. And so when we think about the psychological control that is held over these individuals 
and knowing that this could be a pastor, a doctor, a child services caseworker. You know, think about how psychologically, who's going to believe you when I hold this position? And then lastly, another theme that we see here is diversity, right? Because looking at this slide, we're seeing all different genders, we're seeing all different races, we're seeing all different ethnicities. So when we say that human trafficking doesn't discriminate, not when it comes to its victims, it doesn't discriminate when it comes to its traffickers either. Anybody can be a victim of human trafficking, just like anyone can be a trafficker. And because of this, we want to be able to ask the question, why is this important to healthcare? Why is this important to each and every one of us in this room? I asked this question more than a decade ago, and the answer that I found was incredibly startling. Nearly 90% of victims recovered from the life of trafficking stated that during their time of exploitation, they were seen and or treated by a healthcare provider and human trafficking wasn't recognized. Nearly 90%. And again, remember, I'm very careful about sharing statistics. While this number is very startling, it does not account for those who have lost their life to trafficking, nor does it account for those who have yet to disclose. But what it does serve as a great reminder to us as to why we need to be aware of the barriers to identification. When we think about the barriers to identification, the number one barrier that makes this so incredibly challenging is traumatic bonding to the trafficker. Remember, we talked a little bit about the fact that anybody can be a trafficker. So these individuals may be trafficked by their family members. In addition to this, we talked about that whole grooming process and that development of a bond and the facilitation of a relationship. And so these individuals may actually love their trafficker. In addition to this, providers face incredible challenges when it comes to language, social, and cultural barriers. That's why for every single person that is in attendance today, it is imperative that if you are working with an individual that has English as a second language, you have an appropriate interpreter present to speak on behalf of you and on behalf of them. Other barriers that we see are fear of law enforcement or service providers. These individuals may have committed crimes because of their traffickers. They may have warrants out for their arrest and they have the trafficker telling them, who's gonna believe you, you're a criminal, if you disclose. And then that puts them in fear of other service providers as well. Another challenge that we face is normalization of exploitation. When we think about the culture that we live in, where we have music and video games glamorizing pimps. And we see time and time again where prostitutes are arrested. We have created a culture where there is a normalization of exploitation. I'm very proud to state though, um, as mentioned before, that one of the roles that I serve on is being a part of the HTI Commission through the Ohio Attorney General's Office. And you'll be pleased to know that there are great initiatives moving forward that are now sending Johns to John School, that are now um, arresting the traffickers rather than the victims. And so we are trying to shift that culture of the belief that no one cares. But the barriers are still there and it's very hard. And making it even harder is the fact that Human trafficking is a multi-billion dollar industry. Because of this, traffickers are going to go to great lengths to protect their investment. And in doing so, these individuals may experience captivity, confinement, and isolation. If you're working with them in a clinical setting, they may have guarded frequent companionship. 
making those statistics that we stated before so challenging. There may be threats of violence. Again, traffickers are going to protect their investment, which then leads to fear, shame, and self-blame. And then lastly, you'll see here, there's a term that maybe many of you are not familiar with, and that is debt bondage. And when we think about debt bondage, I have two examples that come to mind. The first one is, let's reflect back for a moment on Harold's story. So with Harold's story, you know, he came from India to Cincinnati, Ohio. When we think about this, it's very easy for the trafficker to say, I paid a lot of money for you to travel here. Now you owe me. You need to do this, this, and this in order to earn your freedom. And so the sad part about debt bondage is that an individual will do what the trafficker says to do, thinking that there's an opportunity to earn their freedom. And then looking at it from the perspective of sex trafficking, think for a moment. You have this vulnerable youth who has now moved in with their trafficker, who's done all of these nice things for them. I did all these nice things for you. I, I've given you a place to stay. I bought you these nice gifts. I did all of these things. And now I'm having trouble making rent this month. So now I just need you to do this one thing for me. Just go out and be a date, and I'll never ask you to do it again. And you know what? To make it a little easier, I'm going to go ahead and take the edge off. I'm going to go ahead and take the edge off by giving you a little something. And now the trafficker has introduced substance abuse. And then the victim needs the trafficker just as much as the trafficker needs the victim. And we collaboratively, as providers, Regardless of the service industry that we are working in, these are the barriers to identification that each and every one of us face. But the number one barrier to identification for each of us is the clinical picture. So when we think about the clinical picture, in our minds, we believe that these individuals knowing that they have experienced physical, potentially sexual, mental, and emotional abuse, that they're going to present like the textbook picture of abuse. In our minds, we believe that they're going to present with low self-esteem, that they may be quiet, that they may be fearful of touch, withdrawn, and depressed. But a victim of trafficking may not present that way. These individuals may be confident they may appear rushed. I got to get this done. I got to get out of here. They may have a quota of time that they have to be back for. They could be flirtatious and welcome social encouragement. They could be powerful and they may be defensive. And you might say to yourself, well, how is this possible? Well, you have to consider for a moment. Don't you think that you need to be pretty powerful and defensive to be able to walk into a hotel room time and time again, not knowing what's going to happen to you. And let's take for a moment that you runaway youth or that child that has been groomed, that it is their responsibility, it is their job to welcome social encouragement, it is their job to be flirtatious. And that's where we as healthcare providers, service workers in general, we need to take a moment to step back we need to consider the person and their situation and why they are acting the way that they are. And we also need to remember that every single person responds to and processes trauma differently. And because of this, we can see that these individuals may actually flip back and forth between these things. And so with that being said, there actually is no clinical picture. But it is my hope that by the conclusion of this presentation, I will have inspired each and every one of you to look for the picture that you don't see. When looking at this slide here, I want you to just take a moment and consider the possibility that the very first time that you encountered Grace, you treated her with kindness, compassion, non-judgmental, trauma-informed care. And I want you to think 
for just a moment that you took the opportunity, even if she wasn't ready, even if she didn't want to disclose, to plant a seed. And you gave her a resource and let her know that when, when needed, this is a safe space and I'm here for you. And then let's just say you met her in picture two and you did the same thing. You met her with kindness and compassion. And the same could be said with picture three and picture four. Maybe, just maybe, and I only say maybe because research has shown that it can take up to four to six times before a victim is ready to disclose. But maybe, just maybe, you wouldn't see her in picture five, six, or seven. And so it is so incredibly important if there's anything that you take away from today that you always take the time to remember the picture that you don't see and that you plant that preventative seed. And that was why I shared my story with each of you, because I know the power of a preventative seed. But the picture that you may see from a psychosocial standpoint is that these individuals may present with anxiety and depression. Absolutely so. They may present with somatization. Somatization, to best say it in layman's terms, is that these individuals may be experiencing symptoms with no organic cause. So you think for a moment, they may be experiencing stomach aches, nausea, headaches, and it's all due to the psychological anxiety and depression and fear that they are experiencing. They may also present with suicidal ideation, uh, substance abuse. We talked about how traffickers use that as a means of control. And that's why every single one of you in this room has the opportunity to look past the addiction and see the person. Look past the addiction for the picture that you don't see. And they may also present with post-traumatic stress disorder, having anxiety attacks. So we need to do a better job collaboratively linking medical to mental with all the folks that we serve. We need to be looking at them medically, psychologically, and also socioeconomically to be able to meet their needs. And when looking at them medically, these are some of the most common symptoms that you will see from a physical presentation for labor trafficking. So you'll notice here that the first two things listed are dehydration and heat stroke. Remember, these folks are working in deplorable conditions. You'll see that I have bolded for you diabetes, blood pressure, dental, and vision concerns. Harold specifically asked me to do this because he said, whenever you lecture healthcare providers, let them know that these are the things that we may commonly present with because of lack of preventative care. These individuals may offer, off, also suffer from malnutrition. So for those of you in the room that are dietitians, this could be a red flag indicator. Sleep deprivation, skin infections, pesticide and chemical exposure, sanitation-related illnesses. Think about, again, all of you who work in public health. Think about the deplorable work conditions that they're in. And when you're assessing environments, start having conversations with people as well. You could be frontline identifiers. And then with musculoskeletal injuries, for all of you in the room who are going to school for physical therapy, this is something for you to be mindful of. When we look at the physical presentation for those involved in the life of sex trafficking, these are some of the most common complaints. So we can see that these individuals may present with headaches, and memory loss. They may present with fractures, contusions, and back pain. I'm coming back to traumatic brain injury. They may present with burns, such as cigarette burns. They may present with pelvic pain, frequent urinary tract infections, unwanted pregnancy, and hepatitis. And you'll see here that I have a few things that are bolded, one of them being dental complaints. These individuals may have dental complaints due to lack of preventative care. It could be due to physical abuse, having their teeth knocked out, 
or better yet, pulled out. Um, it could be due to tooth decay due to substance use. So it is absolutely imperative for those who are going to be public health workers, we know more public health facilities are actually now having dental clinics. Every single public health care provider should be trained on human trafficking. And then you'll also see here that's bolded traumatic brain injury and strangulation. We know that in the life of sex trafficking, and when I say the life, I'm saying this because this is what victims commonly refer to, um, that non-fatal strangulation occurs more often than not. And many a times, these individuals, they may not even know what that means. So it is extremely important that when you are assessing your patients, that you're talking to them and asking the questions, did anyone do anything to come harm to your head or your neck? Was there any kind of pressure that was placed on your neck? Because they may present with petechiae, they may present with bruising, but they may have no signs or symptoms at all. And so it's so important for us to know how dangerous strangulation is, that it can be seconds to unconsciousness and minutes to death. And you've heard me refer throughout the presentation about Harold. And the reason why I'm doing this is because it is so incredibly important that your work be survivor informed. We learn so much from survivors and in a little bit, you're gonna have a great opportunity <laughs> to hear from one of the most remarkable survivors that I know. And one of the things that she taught us when it comes to the physical presentation of sex trafficking is that when it comes to strangulation too, this could be due to oral sex. And so it is so imperative that we create a safe space to have conversations with patients, understanding where they're coming from, what they've been through, and speaking to them in a way that they feel safe and supported enough to disclose. And so, in addition to knowing the physical presentation and how they may present medically, it is essential that we also know how they are acting. So you can see here that we've provided a list for you of what the red flags are. And the reason why I say we is because this list is both evidence-based and survivor informed. And for those of you who are at the tables, you will find in your folder that some of the work that we've been doing um, through the Ohio Attorney General's office is that um, when we have our chair here, Heather Wild of the Healthcare Subcommittee, is we created a healthcare policy template that is now available on the AG's website for any of our virtual audience to download, but also for the audience members here, we have a copy in your folder. And what makes this list so incredible is that survivor voice. And a great example of this is, you'll see here it says, has much older boyfriend, girlfriend, or suspicious person. We learn from talking with Annette that many a times these individuals, if being trafficked by the drug dealer, they may be accompanied in the clinical setting by a teenager who's learning the ropes. And so it seems a lot less suspicious, doesn't it, if an individual presents with someone that could appear as a child, a niece, a nephew, or a sibling. In addition to this, you'll see that these individuals could have inconsistent stories, new expensive clothing that they may not be able to afford. But on the flip side of that, they may present in the clinical setting without having slept for days. They may present not having bathed or showered. And so one of the most important things for us to remember is that while we really need to know the red flag indicators, it's also important to remember that there may be no red flag indicators. And when I look at this list here and I reflect on my career um, and I think back, probably one of the things that I missed was branding. And when we think about branding and what it is, this is a means of control that is used by traffickers. And when I was in nursing school, I was taught to assess 
everything, everything on my patient from head to toe. But nobody taught me to assess who was accompanying them in the clinical setting, nor did anyone teach me to assess tattoos. And for those of you that aren't going into the nursing field, regardless of what profession that you're in, isn't a tattoo a great segue for a conversation? You know, I, I see you have some body art. Can you tell me a little bit about it? This is showing the individual, number one, that you're not passing judgment on them, because we do know that there's still some stigma associated with tattoos. And number two, it's opening up the lines of communication for a meaningful conversation, showing that you're invested in them, right? And then when we look at um, some of the tattoos that are placed on these individuals, they all show signs of ownership and property. And I want you to think for just a moment, what would it be like if every day you woke up and you looked in the mirror and you saw a dollar sign on your face or you saw someone else's name on your neck or on your chest or across your face? Psychologically, what does that do to an individual? It's telling them that you're no longer a person. Rather, you're a piece of property that can be bought and that can be sold. So when we reflect back on those barriers to identification and we ask these questions, well, why don't they just disclose? Well, why don't they just tell us? These are the signs of trafficking that make it so incredibly challenging for a person to disclose and they are also the signs of trafficking that give us an opportunity to maybe, just maybe, start a meaningful conversation and just maybe, maybe plant a seed. This clicker is not working. <laughs> I am so sorry. I want to take a moment really quick while we're waiting because the clicker is not working um, to ask all of you here, prior to this presentation, have any of you thought about human trafficking as being a public health care crisis? I see some hands, a little bit more than the other questions, so that's good, that's good. Um, the reason why I, I say this is because when we're thinking about human trafficking and we're thinking about branding, one of the things that I wanted to bring to attention is that these tattoos can take places in homes, but they can also take places in tattoo shops. So for those sanitarians or first responders that are going into establishments and inspecting, it's so incredibly important for you to know that if you're going into a tattoo shop, you could be a frontline identifier for human trafficking. And it is my sincere hope that at this point in the presentation, you're starting to see the link between public health and human trafficking. So when we think about human trafficking as a public health care crisis, it's important for us to realize that preventative care is non-existent for these folks, right? and that these individuals could potentially be exposed to and or carrying diseases such as COVID-19, MRSA, tuberculosis, influenza, sexually transmitted infections, HIV and AIDS. And so even if you're sitting in this room today and you're thinking to yourself, well, human trafficking is never gonna impact me, when you think about it from the perspective of a public health care crisis, this has the potential to impact every single one of us in this room. And because of that, it's so incredibly important for us to not only think of it as a social justice issue, but as a public health care crisis as well. And so when we think about it as a public health care crisis, we want to be mindful of both the entry points versus the access points when encountering these individuals. So when we look at entry points versus access points, we've talked a great deal about recruitment by traffickers. We've had conversations about familial trafficking, remembering that our foster youth are very high risk and that parents and family members can be traffickers as well. 
And another thing to note with familial trafficking, because of the normalization of exploitation within the family structure, this can make it very hard to, number one, recognize red flags, and number two, it can be very hard for these individuals to want to disclose. When we think about social media, we talked again about the opportunity for anyone to come into our home at any given time. And for those of you who are college students, I'm sure you've all heard of Sugar Daddy. And we also know that there are a number of companies that are reaching out asking um, individuals to be ambassadors. Let me tell you something. If it sounds like it's too good to be true, it probably is. And I hope after this presentation, if someone like that reaches out to you, you're gonna take a second guess. When we talk about, we've talked a little bit about runaways and how they're easily exploited. The same can be said with drug addiction, as well as financial constraints. When we reflect on COVID-19, individuals who may have not been in a financial um, impaired situation before may now be struggling. And then with the facilitation of the grooming process, there's that whole deception of an opportunity at a better life. But you remember when I started this presentation, I was very emotional, very emotional. And the reason why was because I was looking at this audience and I was seeing hope. I was seeing hope because evidence-based research has shown us that these are the number five critical access points where these individuals may have the potential to have intervention. And I know, I know there's a number of you in this room today that may go into one of these fields. And I also know that out of all of you here today, we all have family and we all have friends. And so when we look at this slide and we think about entry points versus access points, I challenge you to look at it one more time and consider the opportunity for exit points, right? And so with that being said, I just want to take a moment and I want to stop and check in. Is everyone doing okay? Yeah? Okay. It's pretty heavy content, right? But I want you to walk away today as heavy as this content is knowing that you are the hope. Now I'm getting emotional again. Um, because in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity, right? And in each and every single one of you, I see that opportunity. And so when we think about opportunity, we need to start thinking about not only identification, we need to start thinking about collaboration. Frontline identifiers may also provide critical resources to address victims' immediate, immediate, complex and multifaceted needs. Why do you think I'm stressing the word immediate? Any ideas? Because remember, it can take anywhere from four to six times before an individual is ready to disclose. But you can be that frontline person that meets their immediate need. Maybe it's just 20 minutes of sleep. Maybe it's offering them something to eat, giving them something to drink. Maybe it's just showing them kindness or empowering them by having a choice, a choice that they've never had before. But the other critical piece in this is that we have to start looking at collaboration. It is absolutely essential, absolutely essential that when doing this meaningful work that we do not work in silos. When we think of the complex, multifaceted needs of these folks, we need to know what is happening in our community, we need to know how we can collaborate, and we need to know what resources are available. When we look at this list here, you know, law enforcement, they may be the individuals that can help them out of an unsafe situation. Fire and EMS, they could be frontline identifiers in the community. Medical, they can treat their medical needs. Um, we look at mental health and substance treatment. Educators are key in ensuring that each of these people have effective understanding of what human trafficking is. Public health workers, we've given great examples. Community members, getting involved and actually understanding what human trafficking is and dispelling the myths. And then just basic, simple necessities. 
safety, housing, and food, something that each and every one of us should be entitled to. And so in planning this presentation, I have to share with you, I looked a great deal at identification and collaboration points. Next slide. And I thought long and hard about the importance of education and the understanding of a trauma-informed approach. So again, I'm gonna take a poll here. How many of you in this room have been trauma-informed trained? Please give me a show of hands. Okay, maybe a little under half, yeah? Well, that's a whole nother presentation in itself. But for time's sake, one of the most important things that I can say is it is not what you ask, it is how you ask the questions. Instead of saying to that individual that you see coming in time and time again, oh, what is wrong with you? You're back again. Instead, maybe change the narrative and say, what happened to you? Invest in who they are as a person and take the time. Be mindful of your tone, your cadence, your body language. They're going to know if you're rushed. They're going to know if you're not interested in who they are as a person, if you're not treating them with kindness and respect. We need to be mindful of our engagement, our eye contact, and using that non-judgmental, supportive approach. We also need to consider gender and culture. Remember, anybody can be a victim of human trafficking, and we need to create inclusive environments. And the number one thing, the absolute number one thing that you can do if an individual is a consenting adult, they're not in imminent danger, the number one thing that you can do is respect the no, right? Because you might be the first person, the only person that's given these folks the opportunity to say no. And you know how empowering that is? So yes, we need to, obviously, mandatory reporters, we have to report what is reportable. This is why we need those policies and procedures in place, hint, hint, template in your folders that you can use to be an advocate for those things. But in all goodness and kindness, if they're not ready to disclose, simply respect the no. Because with these folks, the end really is just the beginning. And in respecting the no, maybe, just maybe, the next time that you encounter them, they'll be ready. And while identification is so incredibly crucial in this work, and you're gonna hear a, li a little bit later about how important identification is from our wonder panel wonderful panelist speaker, Carolyn, it's important for us to know that in the reality, the end is merely the start of a very long beginning. A beginning that is in dire need of systematic, survivor-informed, evidence-based changes provided through an interprofessional, trauma-informed lens. When thinking about this presentation, I wanted to change the narrative. I wanted to kind of think outside the box. For over a decade now, I've been educating healthcare providers on the assessment and identification of victims. But if we really want to combat human trafficking, the best way for us to do this is to do it in a meaningful way that hits all of the points, beginning with prevention, right? Identification is absolutely crucial, but we hear time and time again, human trafficking wouldn't exist if there wasn't a customer. But I wanna remind you for a moment, human trafficking wouldn't exist if there wasn't not only a customer, a victim or a trafficker. So you can see here at the top of this list is educators. We need to be educating not only to ensure that people don't fall victim to human trafficking, we need to be educating our youth so they don't grow up to be John, so they don't grow up to be traffickers. We need to really change the way that we are providing education. And we also need to make sure that with prevention, that's educating all of the service providers who are critical in the assessment and identification of victims. 
And you can see on this slide here, these are the key stakeholders that can change the narrative and the impacts that we can have on human trafficking. And when we think about identification, we also need to start thinking, having forward thinking about empowerment. The reason being is because remember, I said with identification, the end is only the start of a long beginning. So when we think about empowerment and we ask a person to disclose and they're brave enough to come forward and do so, we better make sure that we are prepared to meet the many complex needs that these individuals face. We need to make sure that we are prepared to empower individuals who have been just merely existing to finally begin truly living. And some of those things are very challenging. We obviously need to make sure that these individuals are safe. They may be in need of housing and food. They may be in need of their GED or education. They may need transportation. We have to remember they may have criminal records. And so you're going to have a great opportunity to hear from Annette a little bit later, who is one of the first people in our state to have her record expunged. Uh, these individuals may need childcare, rehab, counseling, healthcare access, employment. It is absolutely essential that if you are going to ask the question, that you are prepared to have the resources that are in need. And if the resources aren't in need, then you need to have that collaboration piece and know what it is that you can do. Can they temporarily go to a domestic violence shelter until they can actually get into a safe home for trafficking? You know, can, can uh, an expert in human trafficking come into the jail, come into the court system and educate the prosecutors and educate law enforcement to help them understand why this person has the record that they have due to their victimization? I mean, the list goes on and on. So when we think about human trafficking and viewing it through an interprofessional lens, specifically for this presentation, the model that I developed looks like this. So, we have prevention on the one side. Everything begins with education and awareness. Education and awareness is key to the prevention of human trafficking. And again, I will remind you, we're not just educating to ensure that someone doesn't become a victim. We want to educate our youth to empower them not to become traffickers or Johns. Um, when we look at that prevention piece, these are all of the people that should have mandatory training on human trafficking, knowing that it's an issue that impacts us all. And then when we look on the other side, we can see that empowerment piece, right? All of the things that these people not only need to survive, but that they need to thrive. And how are we going to do this? We're going to do it by educating ethically and appropriately. We're going to work hard to dispel the myths and truly understand what human trafficking is. We're going to use a trauma-informed approach. And for those of you who didn't raise your hands during this presentation, I want to see hands of the people who are now going to seek out trauma-informed training. Let me see your hands. Good job. And then we're going to collaborate interprofessionally. We cannot work in silos. It takes an entire community and team to help provide the to help address the multifaceted complex needs of these individuals. We need to advocate for evidence-based policy. But in writing that evidence-based policy, we need to incorporate the survivor's voice, right? Because at the end of the day, we can do the research, we can provide the presentations, we can raise awareness, but it's the survivors who are the experts because they've lived the life and they know what they need. And then we are also going to respect the no. In doing this work, it's so incredibly hard because we got into a service industry because we want to serve others. We got into this work because we want to help folks. 
but we also have to be prepared for the folks who aren't ready, but in doing so, treating them with kindness, compassion, using a non-judgmental approach, and providing that trauma-informed care. And so, in conclusion, I shared a little bit with you my story and what the power of a preventative seed could look like. When we come back for the second session, you're going to have the opportunity to see what that critical identification piece will look like and also the value of empowerment. And so when we think about addressing human trafficking interprofessionally, it is so incredibly important for us to remember those three things, prevention, identification, and empowerment. And so as you're reflecting on those during the lunch, I'd like to leave you with this very last important and meaningful quote that relates so incredibly well to the importance of this work. And that is, we cannot force a person to hear a message that they may not be ready to receive but collaboratively, we must never underestimate the power of a planted seed. This concludes my presentation. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Wilkin. Awesome job. This is Lori Furst, and thank you very much, Lori, if you're here. Um, for you, for all the work you've done. Thank you, Phil. Okay. Now we will move on to the lunch phase and there's a system here let me I need my folder <laughs> my wife ladies and gentlemen and, and guests so the lunches are in back they've placed uh, catering's placed them at the table so you, all you have to do is look at your name tag if you have yellow that's turkey bacon you just find the yellow table grab one of those okay we are going to go ahead with our student recognition ceremony. We have several students with us today uh, who we'd like to recognize and honor. So I'm going to invite up uh, the chair of the Department of Public and Allied Health, Carrie Hamady, and Professor Amanda Yost, excuse me, Yost, uh, our medical lab scientist expert. So they're going to present the awards to these very deserving students. Thank you. Hello, welcome everybody, it's so great to see you. We're off to a great start and thank you to Dr. Phil Welch for guiding us through this and getting this uh, symposium up and running. So I wanna thank Dr. Welch. So as he said, I'm Carrie Hamity. I'm the chair of Public and Allied Health, and I am very um, pleased to be able to announce the recipients of this year's PAH Awards. So when I call your name, please come up on the stage and to get your award from Amanda, and then you're gonna get your picture taken too, so make sure you pose for your pictures. All right, so as you can see, our first honoree is for Public Health Program Outstanding Undergraduate Student Madison Baltimore. Okay. 
<laughs> Thank you, Madison. Our next recipient, oh shoot, I was supposed to do that. Oh, now I went too far. Oh, this is very sticky. Okay, we're gonna go with this one until we can get back. Um, our next honoree is in Medical Lab Science Program, uh, outstanding undergraduate student, Kelsey Burgess. Oh, go, go back before Mia. I think there's one. There we go. That's where I need to be. Thank you. Um, our next honoree is for Health Science Pre-Professional Program, Outstanding Undergraduate Student, Bella Wentz. Thank you, Bella. One of your proudest moments was receiving honors and scholarships from distinguished BGSU alumni that propelled my education at BGSU. And she's going to become a physician's assistant. Oh, good. <laughs> Mia, I'm sorry, Mia. It doesn't want to honor you. So Mia, I can say this, I'm in food and nutrition. She is our outstanding undergraduate recipient this year, Mia Johnson. So Mia is going to be attending our dietetic internship starting in the fall, and uh, one of her favorite memories is presenting her BGSU journey to the Intro to Dietetics class this year. Thanks, Mia. All right, we'll get back on track. Oh, we did Kelsey, so we need to go to Tara. There we go. All right. So Tara Heights is also in our food and nutrition program, and she is our outstanding graduate student. She's unable to join us today, um, but she's already passed her RD exam, um, and it will be graduating soon and getting a job in the field. So congratulations to Tara. And then I think Mackenzie Twardzik. She's also a food and nutrition program outstanding graduate student. Um, and I think, yeah, yes, she was able to attend today. Um, so congratulations, Mackenzie. <laughs> Mackenzie is also one of our dietetic interns working on her master's degree. Um, and she'll be um, graduating soon. And her advice is to believe in yourself. You are more capable than you think. And you can see Mackenzie's picture with her little one up there. All right, our next recipient is for the Early Career Master of Health Services Administration Outstanding Alumni, and that's Abigail Mathis Myers. <laughs> Abigail also gives advice to our new Falcon grads to seek out mentorship and don't be afraid to apply to any role. Our next um, Outstanding Alumni Award for the Food and Nutrition Program goes to Carmen Young. <laughs> Carmen came all the way from Arizona because she missed uh, being on campus and she wanted to come back. We're so excited that she's here to receive this award. Um, her advice is to put yourself out there. Confidence in your applications and interviews is key. Stay in touch with your mentors and advisors. You never know how much they might help you. Thank you, Carmen. <laughs> All right. And our last award is for the Public Health Program Outstanding Preceptor Award, and that goes to Jim Watkins. So 
So Jim's favorite memories, he's enjoyed working with BGS students over the years to help them succeed, and his advice is to make as many connections as you can. Your perspectives will change over time and be a lifelong learner. So I think we can kind of see a little bit of um, connection with all of this advice about staying in touch with your mentors and your professors here and your preceptors. So thank you, Jim. Can we go back to that? And then for Madison, she plans to attend grad school and her proudest BGS moment is receiving the 2023 Women of Distinction Award and she mentored students for three years. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, so we're going to move on to the next part of the program. Oh, oh did I not say, I, I think I said that for Bella. Okay, I think I did. Um, we're gonna move to the next section, right? Okay, um, so I'm going to invite Laura back up to the stage to get the panel started. Thank you. Did everyone have a nice lunch? Yes? Okay, good, good, good. All right. So it is with great pleasure um, that we do have some excellent panelist speakers here with us, my dear friends that I'm going to now invite to the stage. I wanna let them get a little settled before we, we go into the next portion of this. Oh, you know what, as you come up, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. It's nice to see everybody. How everybody doing? I am Nat Mango, and I am a survivor that's thriving now. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. My name is Heather Wild. I am a forensic nurse and I am the coordinator of a forensic department in Columbus, Ohio. I am also the current chair of the Ohio um, Health or Healthcare Subcommittee for the Human Trafficking Commission for the Attorney General. And additionally, I also work on the front lines with an organization in Columbus called Out of Darkness, which is also very important to me, spending time with women in the life of human trafficking. Hello everybody, my name is Carol Lynn Kinkoff. I am a human trafficking survivor parent. Um, unfortunately, my daughter Courtney passed away. She was found in an abandoned apartment last year in Cleveland, Ohio. So I am here to tell you a little about, about her journey uh, with medical providers and what you can do to make a difference in the life of victims. Um, so that that doesn't happen to other victims. And I've propelled that pain into purpose as a co-founder of the Alliance Against Human Trafficking in Lake County. And we have built a coalition along with two partners, uh, one of whom is here, Kathy Golnitz, a forensic nurse who I absolutely love, and Jenna Bang, um, who's not here with us today. So thank you for joining us. I'm very honored to have my dear friends here as panelist speakers, and I'm not going to say any more about them because I'm gonna, going to cry again. <laughs> so um, before we kick off with the panel, I just want to take a moment to have each and every one of you reflect on what it is that we've learned thus far about addressing the issue of human trafficking and doing so and viewing it through an interprofessional lens. And as you're reflecting on that, I now want you to take a moment to please meet Alexis. Hello, my name is Steven. I'll be your nurse today. Hey, Steven. I'm Josh. How are you? Nice to meet you. And you are? Uh, you I'm a brother. Okay. A little bit older brother. Okay, nice to meet you. And your name is? 
This is Alexis. Alexis, okay. Yeah. How old are you, Alexis? She's 14 years old. 14? Yeah, I'm okay. Okay. Um, do you have any form of ID on you, Alexis? Yeah, I got her ID. I don't trust her with anything. You hold on to it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just want to take this over to registration. We'll, I'll get right back okay. with you guys, okay? All right. All right. Okay. So I talked to registration. They just had a few more questions regarding the ID and all that. Do you okay. can I have a second to go talk with them? What kind of questions? They just had standard admission questions as well. All right. Uh, here, more. let me talk to you real quick. Okay. Um, so our parents left when we were a little bit younger. Okay. I've been taking care of her. She had some issues, bipolar. We think she tried to hurt herself. Okay. She gets with guys a lot. We think one of them got a little bit rough with mm -hmm. her. So that's why I don't really want to leave her alone. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to call my cousin. She's uh, Nikki. She's out in the waiting room. She'll come sit with her while I'm okay. there. Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right. All right. Okay. Hello. Oh. Hey, you must be Nikki? Yeah. Right? Okay. I'm her cousin. cousin. Okay. Nice to meet you. I'm Steven. I'll be your nurse. Okay. All right, Alexis. I just want to start off by doing a quick assessment on you. You have an abdominal pain, correct? Okay. It started yesterday. Sorry, yesterday. What would you rate that pain on the scale of zero to ten? Ten being the worst. She rated it at a nine. A nine. What time was that at? Uh, earlier today. Are you still feeling it about a nine there, Alexis? Yeah, about an eight or nine. Okay. Now, is there anything else going on, like nausea, vomiting? No. No, she just had a little bit of um, bleeding. Okay. Going to the bathroom, and it's not her time for menstrual. Um, I, we think that she might have tried to do an abortion yesterday. Oh. We're not sure. Okay. okay. So, um, Alexis, is it fine if you have family at the bedside while I do my assessment? Yeah, it should be. I'm her cousin, and okay. I've raised her since she's been little. So it's okay with yeah. you. Okay. Well, I just want to take a listen to your heart and lungs. Do you mind to unzip your hoodie for me there? So you have a tattoo there. When did you get that? She's had it for a while. She has? Okay. Does the numbers on it mean anything to you? No, she just thought it was something cool. You know kids these yeah, days. Yeah, I understand that. Okay. Well, I just want to take a look at your abdomen and, and a listen with my stethoscope. Is that okay with you? Okay. around if you have any pain you let me know okay that hurt okay I'll stop there I don't want to you do more pain well I want to go check with the doctor I just have a couple more questions with you though do you do you have any past use of drugs can alcohol? we just get this why are all these questions can just, we just get treatment done and so we can get out of here okay I understand what are you doing about her pain then? We'll we'll get that treated like I said I'm gonna go talk with the doctor did they um, collect a urine specimen on well, you? When we first got here, they wanted one. They we did. gave them one. Okay, so they got one. Okay, well, I'll go check with the doctor. We'll see what he wants to do, and I'll get back with you, okay? Is there anything I can get you? You want to eat fine. a blanket or no, anything? She's fine. Okay. All right, I'll be back. Okay. I talked to the doctor. He wants to take you down for an x-ray of your abdomen just to see what's going on. So it won't take but more than five to ten minutes. We'll bring you right back. Okay. Quick procedure. I'll go with her. Um, we'll have to have you wait in the waiting room if that's okay. I really don't want to leave her alone. Can I uh, yeah. talk to you a little oh, yeah. bit about? For sure. I, I know my cousin I told you about mm -hmm. her history and everything, and she's harmed herself multiple times before. She runs when she gets in situations that she's scared of, and so so, I really think that she might try and run or do something to herself while okay. if she's by herself. Are you so I really think I need to be with her. Like to zip herself up. She, doctor wants to uh, have an extra gun around and then just to see what's going on. That's fine. So we're yeah, just going to go ahead. We were going to, I was going to see if you guys could just wait in the waiting room for me while we go down. Oh, no, she'll, she'll take off. She's, well, she's a mess. I know I understand you guys are concerned about her safety, but hospital policy says that we have, we have to take well, her along. How about I just walk with her and then I can sit outside the room? Yeah, and your policy just made me wait for 20 minutes for nothing. I understand. Well, how about with this? We'll have you guys wait in the room here until we get back. Like I said, it's only going to be five, ten minutes, and I will be right with her the whole time. She'll be safe. Alexis, you better not cause any trouble back there. We'll keep her safe. So, be like I said, more than five, ten minutes. So, 
That's fine, okay? Right. Just get it done. All right. All right, we'll get that done. In meeting Alexis, each and every one of you had an opportunity to recognize some barriers to identification. And normally when educating on this topic, I would go into a very uh, intense debrief session with each of you, but right now we have to be respectful of time for our panelists. So I would just like to ask three audience members to shout out for me a barrier to identification that you recognized. They never, left her alone. they never left her alone. Very good job. What else? They wouldn't let her talk. They wouldn't let her talk. Excellent. Can I get one more? He had her ID. He had her ID. Each and every one of you, just from that very short presentation, were able to pick up on those unique red flag indicators, showing you why it is so incredibly important that we are aware of that critical identification piece. And to really solidify this, we have with us Carolyn, who's going to come and join us, and she's going to share with us the critical difference that identification would have made in both her life and the life of her daughter, Courtney. This is never easy. Thank you, Laura, for having me. I'm hoping to tell you a little bit of Courtney's story so you can recognize some entry points that can be identified to create possible exit points for victims you may encounter in your practice. The three audience members who shouted out, she was never left alone. Um, unfortunately for my daughter Courtney, she met her trafficker when she was hospitalized for a mental health diagnosis in 2015 at a very reputable Cleveland hospital. He presented as a person with mental illness that was the same as hers. It gave them a reason to bond, which became a trauma bond. I've shared with many of the nurses in my life, there are many, and I adore each and every one of them, including Lara, <laughs> Heather, who I've just met, Kathy, and my mother. My mother is a retired nurse. She spent 40 years as a volunteer on the board for the Nord Center in Lorain, Ohio, and was a psychiatric nurse. So Courtney met her trafficker in 2015. They developed a relationship. But I want to tell you real quick a little bit about Courtney's history. She had esotropia and strabismus and several um, surgery, surgeries uh, to correct her vision. She was bullied as a child. She suffered from sexual assault um, by friends, which she later admitted to an ED nurse that she was gang raped. Unfortunately, it wasn't until years later that she admitted this. She was in an, a relationship with a young man at the age of 15 who gave her alcohol and uh, convinced her to have sex with him. She cried when she told her father and me. She had a relationship when she was a little bit older in high school, probably around 17. Um, she was, it was a healthy relationship um, from what we could tell, and, and all indications still lead me to believe that. However, she started struggling at school because she was um, not diagnosed for ADHD. She had inattentive type ADHD, so when I had asked her doctor, her uh, pediatrician in seventh grade many years prior if she could have ADHD, which is what the principal suggested I do, the doctor immediately dismissed it and said, no, her grades are fine. Well, when she was 17, her grades weren't fine. She started struggling because she was having difficulties at, at um, Notre Dame Cathedral Latin High School, where she was on scholarship. She was very intelligent. She was in the 99th percentile on several of her test scores. Um, so we knew that something was wrong. She was admitted inpatient um, for, and was misdiagnosed as bipolar. We later found out um, when she was diagnosed, diagnosed with ADHD that it was ADH, inattentive type ADHD and um, depression. So it mimicked bipolar. I tell you this because she was given the wrong medication, which um, led to her first overdose. It was the wrong medication, wrong diagnosis, wrong medication. And it doesn't matter what you call a mental illness, 
um, because they can all present very similar to each other in the mind of a patient, but it does matter what medicine you give them. Um, and sometimes it does matter. So she denied her mental illness throughout her life uh, at, a, at the age of, in 2015, uh, so she must have been about 23. Her um, bipolar diagnosis was fulfilled with a manic episode uh, that turned into schizoaffective bipolar. So that's when she met her trafficker. She had difficulty, the healthy relationship that she had when she overdosed and she was misdiagnosed as bipolar ended abruptly because that young man had um, somebody in his family who had that diagnosis and they just couldn't deal with that. So she lost her support system, which led to a series of abusive relationships. She went to um, Cleveland Institute of Art on a partial scholarship and um, had a domestic violence incident. And I'm telling you all these things because these were all vulnerabilities that made her primed for grooming, that led her into trafficking. And when I tell you that Lara's presentation is the story of my daughter's life, I could take every single one of those slides and put a picture or a medical record or a police report and match every single one of them. She was one of the victims who saw healthcare providers. She was in that up to 90% of victims. No one, not one person could identify it. I begged law enforcement to believe me. I begged doctors to believe me and nurses and case managers and no one did. Up to the point of her death, she was seen by three law enforcement officers within weeks and days of her death. She asked a homicide detective for money. Nobody did anything. There was no interdiction. She had legal guardianship. I was her legal guardian along with her father. Um, hospitals didn't understand that either. And when I tell you that she was in that up to 90% who seeks medical, medical care, she spent all of her Medicare bed days, she exhausted them by the age of 29 to the point where she was denied admission to a local psychiatric dual diagnosis facility because she had used all of her Medicare bed days. Isn't that a red flag? Um, don't you think that if somebody had diabetes, they would still deserve treatment even if they had used all of their hospital time. I think, mind, I think diseases of the mind need to be treated the same way as diseases of the body. I think that Courtney was released too often before she had been treated properly. She needed time for her brain to heal. She was in a car accident in which she was charged with a DUI, and instead of going to the hospital and being tra treated for the traumatic, traumatic brain injury that we now suspect, she was jailed, she was incarcerated. Instead of her traffickers going to jail, she was incarcerated. So everyone who told her, you're not good enough, nobody loves you, nobody will believe you, they were right. They wouldn't even believe me. So how is a victim who has no family, no community support, no advocates, nobody to ask them, what happened to you? How, the children in foster care, how are they gonna get the help that they need? So I'm telling each one of you, these were all barriers to Courtney's care that could have been exit points for her. The only nurse she ever disclosed to regarding her human trafficking victimization was a PASAR nurse when she was incarcerated. And she was with her therapist who had become a jail treatment supervisor. And it was because she had that trust and she was in a safe space that it was safe for her to disclose. And she specifically said, I am a victim of human trafficking and it is unfortunate. And that was all she ever said. It's in her PASAR records. All, everything that I've discussed so far is in her medical records. It's in police reports. Um, she also put in her medical records that she was um, sexually assaulted at gunpoint. Uh, by drug dealers. So we have all of this documentation and unfortunately a lot of the providers missed it. Her trafficker's name is listed in her medical records. He was at every inpatient visit, every hospitalization, every ED visit. And I think the most striking um, encounter that I ever had with a medical professional in a negative way was when her trafficker texted me and said, I picked Courtney up from, with another guy at 55th and St. Clair at McDonald's, and she's accusing me of trafficking her. 
that's not the word he used. He said, I think I'll be her pimp. And I thought, what kind of person texts a mother this, calls a mother, tells her this? And I dismissed it. I said, he's mentally ill. There's something wrong with him. I didn't know what human trafficking was. I missed it too. So I want to tell you about Alexis and the three um, points that were brought up by our audience members. She was never left alone. I can tell you the difference between a trafficker and a concerned parent or caregiver is that we will let you separate us from our children or our, our loved ones because we know that's what's best with, for them. If we have their ID, it's because they've been victimized and somebody else has taken it or, or we have legal guardianship. And I can assure you, anytime Courtney ever needed anything, I was there, despite what she tells the task force detectives. Because that's the only thing she would talk to them about was that I was her rep payee and I wouldn't just let her have money to go buy drugs all the time. But I would take her to buy anything she wanted anywhere, anytime, including Dollar General and the thrift stores. Um, wouldn't let her talk. I would absolutely let Courtney talk. And the problem was, in the beginning, when you saw the, the picture of what victimization looks like in the beginning, she received trauma-informed responses. She, she received that care. But then as her symptoms exacerbated, she didn't. People gave up on her. They didn't treat her the same way that they treated her when she was 17, when she was 29. They treated her like a drug addict and not somebody who was struggling with substance use issues. Um, they didn't understand why she was violent. They didn't understand why sometimes she was flirtatious, um, as Laura mentioned. She asked her doctor out, her PCP out on a date, and he wrote that she was promiscuous after I had disclosed to him that I suspected she was a human trafficking victim. So I just want to finish with something I'd like to read that I wrote for a previous presentation because it reminds me of my friend Annette who is sitting up here and who's gonna to speak to you about empowerment. And when I heard that word, I knew that I had seen it somewhere in one of my presentations and I just wanna find it real quick, maybe. It is critical to protect human trafficking victims from perpetrators. As a survivor mother of a human trafficking victim whose victimization led to her death, it is important to me that human trafficking victims be empowered to recover, not continually victimized, not victim blamed, without diagnostic overshadowing, or leaving them at risk for further harm or death due to not processing sexual assault kits, prosecuting offenders, in providing trauma-informed, responsive care in a comprehensive manner. Thank you. Thank you so much for bravely sharing your story with us and allowing us the opportunity to honor Courtney's memory. Now that we've had a lived experience of that critical identification piece, we want to go back to the beginning and we want to revisit Stephen R.N., who first met Alexis. And we want to take a moment to see how incredibly important not only that identification piece is, but also we want to revisit and reflect on how incredibly important it is for each and every one of us to be human trafficking trained and to have trauma-informed training as well. Dear victim, please don't fault me for what I did not know. In reflecting, I should have not only seen you, but also advocated for you by using a trauma-informed approach. In hindsight, remembering your domineering brother, it would have been best for me to request a female nurse to care for you. Knowing what I now know, I wish I would have thought to do that. 
In the event a female nurse wasn't available, at the very least, I should have pulled a chair up and sat next to you, instead of just standing over you. Yes, my day was busy with other patients, but you were equally as important. I felt in my gut that something wasn't right, which should have prompted me to question your safety, instead of just assuming you hadn't taken your psychiatric medications, or you were just being defiant, as your brother said. I was never taught in nursing school to assess tattoos, but there was something strange about yours. Because I had never seen one like that before, I should have followed up. It is no excuse, but with one unstable patient and a stroke alert on the way, my priorities were elsewhere, when they should have been with you. You will be pleased to know that since caring for you, I participated in human trafficking trainings. Forgive me. I'm sorry that I did not see you before, but I see you now, Alexis. Now that I know, and I understand, you have my word that I will look for you again and again. Sincerely, Stephen R.N. I cannot tell you over the course of the last decade how many healthcare providers that I've educated on this issue and afterwards they've come up and said, I remember this patient this one time. I remember this strange situation. It is important regardless of what setting that you choose to go into in your future or those of you who are currently service providers to remember that you are the critical key. You could potentially be the link between identification and empowerment. And so with that being said, I would now like to invite my dear friend, Heather, who serves as that critical link for so many people to share a little bit of her experience with each and every one of you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for having me here. And it's truly an honor to be sitting next to you, Carolyn and Annette, and be able to provide this education for all of you today. I want to also have a special thank you to the Dean and to Bowling Green University. This is my first time here at Bowling Green and when I was driving in today I noticed their motto, um, a public university for the public good. And that just really warmed my heart just when I was driving in and just hosting this symposium today means so much. And it also made me think of the Attorney General because one of the things he has stated during this time of the Human Trafficking Commission is he really wants to do big good. And I think those two things couldn't be more perfect to be together. And I think that's why we're here today is really to do big public good. So I applaud all of you for taking your time to be here today. So having said that, um, I just wanna kind of focus on one of the words that Lara said and the word link. I mean, how amazing is that we could have a small opportunity to be a link for these people into that empowerment phase. That we may not know it in the moment, but something that we say or a paper that we give them or a resource could be days, weeks, months down the line, what could lead to them getting out of the life of human trafficking. So when we think about identification, Lara gave us so much great advice and red flags and Carolyn shared her story and there's so much information that we have there, but I think sometimes the problem in healthcare settings, no matter what realm you're in, now what do we do? I'm able to identify this patient. Something's not right here. She has this tattoo or he has these red flags, but I'm busy. You know, I've got all these other patients. I've got all these other things to do. If I just treat what's need to be treated, give the antibiotics, do whatever needs to be done, Maybe she'll come back or something like that. I think that's the big struggle. Healthcare today, as we know, it's a little struggling. You know, we're always understaffed and things like that. And that's just the reality of where we are today. But what if you do? What if you do see that patient and you do make a difference and you do reach out? So a couple key takeaways, I guess I would like to say is trauma-informed care is absolutely essential. And with that is looking beneath the surface 
really looking at that patient, not just her tattoos, not just her, the STDs that she's here for, the abscesses or whatever it may be. Let's talk about why have you been here month after month after month with many STDs? You know, it's kind of that what's happened to you? You know, what's going on? Trauma-informed care would be, as Stephen said, pulling up that chair. I remember very vividly some things in my career. I went in to see a patient. This was, she was sexually assaulted. She grabs a hold of my badge, pulls it down and looks at me and says, why do you care? Ooh, <laughs> that'll get you. You know, so I had to pause myself a minute, pull up a chair and sat down next to her, asked if I could just place my hand on her arm and said, I'm concerned about you. And that was all I said. Because one of my mottos is I like to sit in the suck. That's what I call it. Because whatever they're going through, it sucks, let's be honest. And just to sit in that and not talk and spew things at them. And I have these resources and I have to do this because that's what my mind is thinking. I've got five other patients in the ER I've got to go take care of. But just to sit in that for a minute, holding onto her arm, then she started talking. And, and, she st and I didn't have to ask any questions. But sometimes just that little bit of trauma-informed care in knowing that you're going to establish trust in that patient by letting them have conversation is going to go a long way. Telling them that this is going to be a confidential conversation. Talking about mandated reporting, I think, is so important at the beginning because many of these men and women, whether it's sex or labor trafficking, they have a big fear of being arrested and of the police. So unless why they're there, like a sexual assault or something, is not related to a mandated portion incident, you, don't ha you can let them know up front, I'm not going to call the police. This is just a conversation that we're going to have. That's huge for these patients with, as I said, both sex and labor. You want to do your best to not pass judgment on these people. The women that I see on the streets of Columbus, I don't know when the last time they showered was. They don't have a shower. They're often very dirty, or right now, because it's cold, very smoky, because they live in tent camps. So their hands are often, you know, they try to do fires and things like that. So they come in looking a certain way, maybe smelling a certain way, doesn't matter. I'm gonna sit right up next to them. I'm gonna treat them like I would any other patient. So just some of those basic things, you know, Laura mentioned the hierarchy of needs. This is important when they come into the hospital because when is the last time they had a meal or slept when they felt safe? And doing some of those trauma-informed tactics will get you so far. Just let me get you a hot meal, some warm blankets, let you kind of enjoy that for a little while, and then I'll come back. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. When they, and they might not want to talk to you when you come back, but it's going to open the door a little further than just trying to, you know, let me ask you all these questions I have on my checklist. That's not going to go anywhere. So I think that's the important thing is really on the identification piece. Once you might identify something, look beneath the surface. Ask the tough questions. And if you're not comfortable asking those questions, please reach out to somebody who is. If you don't have a forensic team, I'm sure there's somebody in your hospital that's trained. You know, I get it. You may not be the one who's going to ask all the questions. Please tell the nurse, the physician, or whoever it may be to kind of dig a little deeper. Thinking about transitioning to the empowerment phase, I think that can look all kinds of ways. I think empowerment is a big word, and sometimes just, as Laura mentioned, respecting the no gives the power to the patient because they don't get, often get to say no. Or just, you know, I'll, is it okay if I come back later? That's just a choice they get to make. Um, we had a patient come into the emergency department recently. She was picked up by law enforcement in a very affluent neighborhood in Columbus. And she just didn't, it was like three in the morning, they brought her in, didn't know what was going on. She didn't want to speak. She didn't want to sit in the bed. She was covering her face. They suspected the worst, which, you know, okay. So long story short, call the forensic team in and go to see her. And there's a nurse, there's a doctor, there's an aide. Everyone's kind of hovering over her, trying to get her to talk, trying to get her to eat, trying to get her to drink, trying to get her to sit down. Well, you know, that's not going to work. So... I came in and I said, everybody go away. <laughs> if she doesn't want to sit down, who cares? If she doesn't want to have something to drink right now, that's fine too. It's just gave her a little bit of power. Let her get her wits about her a little bit and then let's see what happens. And sure enough, 
I checked back in with her, and we were able to have a conversation. But when three or four adults, including males, are around her, she just wasn't having it. So sometimes it's just that can be empowerment. You know, when I work in downtown Columbus with the women, just this past Monday, there was a girl um, who I've known, I've been there several years, and I've known her a long time. And um, we try to plant the seeds a little bit, but that's not what we're there for. We're there to kind of give them food, clothing, but also options. And she's one we've known for a while, and she knows of the options, and she's never been ready, but she keeps coming back and keeps coming back. And I've developed a pretty good bond with her. Um, I like to work in the clothing room, and I know her style, and I help her pick out clothing that she wants and things like that. So we, we have a little bit of relationship. She walked up to me Monday, walked right in the door, found me, and said, I'm done. I said, ooh. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, goodness. I was like, okay, Heather, you know, be calm. And she said, my daughter's about to be one years old. She doesn't even know me. And she just started crying. I just put my arms around her. I started crying, and we just had a moment. And I said, okay, do you want me to make a phone call? You know what she said? No. She said, not today. I said, ah, okay. But I feel like that's okay. We're that much closer. She knows she has a place to go because we have a safe home with this place I volunteer at as well. And she knows as soon as she says it again, if she's ready, we'll be there and we'll take her to safety. So that to me is also empowering. It didn't happen that day and you know, that's okay. But that's also empowerment for her. I didn't force something on her. I didn't like shove papers at her, you know, let's go make this phone call. She wasn't ready. But I think that gave her some power for sure. So I think empowerment can look very different no matter who you are. I think um, going back to that word link, you know, that's important to all of us. I will say in my career, I can count maybe a handful of times I've actually had the opportunity to get somebody to safety, that they have act actually agreed to leave the hospital or leave the drop-in center that I work in and go to safety. And that's okay. Would I love to have more? Of course. But I can tell you there's been hundreds of people that I have planted a seed. And to me, that's a win. I mean, would I love to put them in the car, call the safety team and get them out the door? Of course. But I know that's not reality. But, but giving them information, planting the seed, to me is still empowering them to change their course. So thank you all. Thank you, Heather, so much for sharing with us the incredible work that you do. We have learned so much from our panelist speakers here about the role of identification, and the value and importance of it. We've also learned about the importance of being that critical link, even if it is just something as simple as planting that seed. You know, I can tell you that even if those individuals didn't go to the safe house, they, can, they will remember, and I know they've remembered, that someone cared about them, and in that moment, that they were seen and they were heard, and that is everything. So, with that being said, without further ado, now that we have a good understanding, when looking at things through an interprofessional lens about prevention, identification. Let us now turn it over to Annette Mango, survivor turned thriver, and have her share with us what empowerment truly means to her. Hi, everybody. Before I start, I want to make sure um, later, is everybody okay? Everybody all right? Well, Y'all need some water, some food over there. <laughs> I noticed that we have people standing up um, over here in the corner. Are y'all okay? I want to let y'all know that if you want to real quickly, we have open seats right here. Come on and sit down right here while I'm talking because everybody else will be able to, to see me. Free food, everything. I just want to make sure everybody okay. All right. So just to let y'all know real quick that... Um, I was, my name is Annette Mango. I like to tell my last name because I am no longer afraid for people to see who I am. Second thing, oh, okay. Um, 
Second of all, I was um, trafficked for like 15 or 20 years. I was off on the street. I was beaten, raped by police officer politics, EMS, all kind of different people, gang rape. Um, I had thousands of traffickers. The youngest probably maybe about 12 or 13 because I am also an addict. And being an addict, I was willing to do anything that I um, had to do to get my fix. And I also want to let you know that I was 35 years old when I got trafficked. So it's not only for younger people, it's for older people too. And you will be amazed how many older people are still out there because they just don't know. I also want to let you know that I think it's a shame that you have to go through the courts to get help, to know anything about this. That's, that's just not right. Empowerment to me. Hmm. Hmm. Empowerment is seeing all of you care. Really. Because all of you are going to give me an ideal. I know it is to help improve myself. Is the president still here? Well, at least, okay, well, at least I know who is here. <laughs> I also do not have a GED, an education. Um, an apartment, personally, if you want an apartment, um, invite me to the college. Give me a job and help me, all these people, help me get my GED. It's not like I haven't tried something along the way I don't know. Help me keep empowering myself. Be the first one to sit up there and say, this is what we're going to do to survivors. This is what we're going to do to help them. I think that would work. People who, and I'm only talking about myself, they look at me and think, oh, she's doing good. She's doing great. Life is hard. Life is, is my life great? Yes, it is, but I'm living, so it's hard. Do I have a place to live? Yes, but do I see people get houses? Yes, I'm doing everything I can. I have a full-time job, and I also have my own business. Being here is my own business because I love speaking to help educate other people to know what it's like out there on the streets. I didn't have a home out there, under bridges, sleeping in bus stops, smelling. Oh, my gosh. Sometimes I still go back there. Um, things still happen. I still have triggers, triggers that I never knew I have. But you have to realize something. I'm happy. And I'm living. So I don't know how all y'all been doing this for this long. But it's hard to wake up and knowing that I have something to do, something to go for. We were just sitting there talking about um, being a peer support. <laughs> and I'm fighting them to the end. Like, no, this is not what I want to be. I don't want to tell nobody what to do. And the reason why I don't want, sometimes I feel like I'm a failure, I'm a failure to um, other people in human trafficking. That's because of the things I went through. As far as, okay, I got out the life. I got out the life. Yes, I did. So now what? Now here I'm at, I'm at another stage. I go to treatment. Where am I going after treatment? I don't have a job. I don't have um, anywhere to stay. Not where I need to stay. I get thrown into a shelter because I have no money. I've been to prison. I was happier in prison. Why? Because I had my own bed. And I had um, washed clothes, clean clothes. I had everything provided for me. I didn't have to no longer go for it. So there, I was safe. Here I am, I'm getting clean. I'm getting the things I need. So I'm happy. That's what I want. Now here I am in real life. And I don't have these things. And here I'm going fighting again. Um, you put me with other people that um, have been to like eight or nine different rehabs. I've been to like nine or ten different homes. 
Why? Because they had the funding. They had the funding that all they had to do was get the grant, and I had to do what they tell me to do. Even though I have done it and repeated it over and over, I had to do to have a roof over my head. I had to do what they tell me to do. And even though I told them that I don't have a education, they said, well, you need to go to domestic violence. I haven't been beat up by a boyfriend. I'm not saying trafficker or being raped. I said by a boyfriend since I was 17 years old. Why would you have me go to domestic violence classes? Why? Because that's where their funding was coming from. Why would I have to go to, here I am in another house, all of us have got to go to the same hospital, see the same doctor. Why? Because we all addicts? Why can't I go to my own doctor? Why can't I go see somebody that don't know what's going on in the same house and so now you're going to treat me and diagnose me as everybody else in the house is? I don't want to hang around everybody who I know to have the same problem as me. I want to hang around somebody who's living. I want to hang around someone who wants to go get a job. I want to hang around somebody who likes to go skating. I like to do this. Anybody know? I want to go skiing. Anybody got some extra skis? I mean, that's for real, too, but I can't afford the skis. You know, these are exciting things that I want to do because I'm getting empowered now. I'm getting better. And these are things that I want to do, but if you keep me around the same people, how can I grow? I'm fighting here for my life. I'm fighting for other people. And when I see someone, I got a lot of business cards too, y'all, if y'all want to see them. Um, when I meet someone and I, I want to help them, but then I'm stuck. And the reason why I'm stuck is because I have a million resources. A million resources, but guess what? There's nine to five resources. These resources that I have, you have to call them and then say, hey, you got to be referred. These resources that are sitting up here saying, okay, well, make an appointment. I need resources now. I need a house, a building for human traffic survivors to help them go different tiers. Okay, you here now, let's get it together. Let's see what your house you need. Let's see what you need. Let's see how we can help you. Okay, now that you good. I mean, you got houses for people to finish with rehab. You get out of rehab, y'all, because I can go. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. You go to rehab, they sit up there and say, hey, once you finish this, once you finish this, you get to get your own hood place. You get to get your own CMHA, you know, so they helping them. But if you're a human traffic survivor, you go to um, rehab, and if you don't get a check, you got to find your own place to live. But they will help you if you get a check, find a low income. This has to stop. We need help. I need people to help me help others because I feel like I'm just, Telling them false hope. I'm getting them out of a situation where they're going to end up going back. And I don't want to lie to them. So that's why I keep saying I don't want to be a sponsor. I don't want to do get people out of situations and then end up getting them sent back. Because you know what? I'm harming them. I'm taking their trust away. And I don't want to do that. Because I know how it feels. And to be here among everybody here, I am so empowered to do this. I think this is like the second, third time I've been to a college. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the little things. Thank you. It's these little things that help us, empower us, because you're willing to take the time to listen. I don't know. How many people want any more? I just want to live and help others because as I help others, they don't know they're helping me. So thank you for being here. Don't forget there's more food. I got cards. <laughs> um, and thank you. Thank you so much. And I am empowered. Don't get me wrong. I am.
I really am. I have a full-time job that they took the chance on me six years ago. And it's making t-shirts, so if y'all need t-shirts, call my company. <laughs> we call my company, and if anybody wants personals, go online and order. So, as y'all can see, I am happy. But there's other people that needs to get this too, just a little bit. And health care, all the cares, just a kind word. Just a kind word and the softness and how you do it. Make them laugh. Make them happy. I see all these happy faces. It's okay. We're going to always have problems, but it's how and what you do with these problems. Thank you for having me and thank you for listening. How can you all see why in, during my presentation I was rather emotional? <laughs> I mean, this is not easy work. It is not easy work. But you can clearly see that this work is meaningful work, right? And just now in that beautiful embrace, you could see a circle of hope. Right? When we think about human trafficking, we can get very, very overwhelmed with the issue. <laughs> <laughs> like <your> guests. <laughs> we can be very overwhelmed with the issue and we can be overwhelmed with the darkness that, that oversees all of it. But then when you sit with a survivor turned thriver, like Annette, when you sit with someone like Carolyn who has turned her pain into passion to help others, and you sit with someone like Heather who works extremely hard to be that link between identification and empowerment or just simply taking the time to plant the seed, we start to see the light that can be shown through that darkness. And each and every one of you have the opportunity to not only be that light, but you have the opportunity to plant that seed. So it is my sincere hope that after leaving today, you will reflect on your role, whether it's in healthcare law enforcement. I know we have some phlo some phlebotomists here. I want to make sure I give them a shout out. We've got physical therapy. We've got nursing. I mean, we have all of these wonderful disciplines that have come together that have the opportunity to collaborate in an interprofessional way and to create a new way for people like Annette to not only be a survivor, but to be a thriver who is empowered to do what she wants to do most, and that is to simply do what we do every day, which is to live. So with that being said, this concludes our Human Trafficking Symposium. I cannot thank the university enough for supporting this cause. That means so incredibly much to all of us. I also could not do this meaningful work without my dear friend and colleague, Tracy McGinley. I want to give a shout out to her. Um, she is a criminal justice professor. She actually runs the program at Firelands BGSU. And we do a lot of training, education, and amazing work in the community. And she is a beautiful champion for this cause and someone I'm very proud to call my dear friend. So. With that being said, once again, thank you. I don't know, do we have enough time for questions? We do? Excellent, I didn't think we did. So with that being said, does anyone have any questions? And if you do, are these mics working? 
Yes, so if anyone has any questions, please take the time to come up now. I know Annette will be happy to answer your questions for sure. No questions? Okay. Don't be shy. Testing. <laughs> I think it's, it's good. Yeah, please don't be shy. Um, we have yeah a few minutes here, so hop up here. Make sure you turn the microphone on. And also note the CEUs are available. I'm going to be sending an email out tomorrow. So check your email tomorrow for the evaluation form. Come on up. Excellent. Excellent. We have our first question. Hello, um, this question is for Annette, and in, um, first of all, I'm Cheryl, and I, I hail from Finley, Ohio, in public health, and uh, if you didn't know, April is Second Chance Awareness Month. Yes, and uh, what I, my question for you is, um, next week, well, in a couple weeks, we're having um, an event in Finley. We're helping individuals with incarceration pasts address barriers to success. And I noticed in the program you had some charges expunged. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of just speak on that and the challenges you went through to get that to happen? Because it's pretty arduous from, from my understanding. Um, yes. Well, April is not only my second chance. It's my birthday too. So, um, <laughs> Mark. Um, and I got interviewed not only for um, from the court, because I did graduate from a court, human trafficking court, and I was interviewed for that, and then I actually, that came to my job, so it is. Um, about the second chance, um, yes, I got, I had, how many pictures did I have? <laughs> I want, anyway, I want you to start using them pictures instead of using them, that girl right there, I want you to use my pictures so they can really see. Um, can, you, can you tell them, can you tell them that um, we created a timeline for you so they know? Yes, um, I've probably been arrested like 15, 16 times. They only got some. And it was a, a timeline in between that. And all of them was for prostitution. Um, and once I went to that court and I finished that um, court, it is help as fun as getting expungement. I was one of the first people in um, Ohio to get it expunged for the fact that it was cause of for human trafficking, which they were calling me. I wasn't no good. I, um, I was hopeless because of my age. No one took the time to look and find out why, why I kept on getting the same sentences, why everything was the same. Um, I had a policeman come to me and say, I just, I just uh, arrested you. Why is you in the same place? I had nowhere else to go. That's why I'm in the same place. I had um, a different trafficker, like I said, because of my addiction. So to answer your question, there is help from there. Longest day, um, you have to actually go through a program. I did, but as I'm finding out that, that we have lawyers now who's volunteering their time to help human trafficking um, survivors with this, um, the goal is they don't have to do what I did to do a program, so there is help. We have, I got to do this, we have Linda here, Linda Fire from Ohio, <laughs> a safe journey. Um, OT, she's here. If anybody have any questions about that, I, I'm quite sure she'll be happy. I love her um, to answer that question, but um, please, um, and Finley, if you need me there, let me know so I can make sure I don't have another um, time there because my job is very um, lenient with me and I have a lot of PTO <laughs> that I say for things like that. I would like to encourage them women in Finley to sit here and do this because um, even though I still have um, things I'm going, like I'm trying to get a weapon, but they're sitting up here telling me that I, I guess myself haven't been expunged enough, but it's still, the whole fact is for you to just do that, and um, it's hard. It's hard because, first of all, with every charge that you get, you, that takes you back. It takes you back to what happened, how it happened. So make sure that you have um, informed or somebody from trauma there at first before you go try to do this for any of these women 
in the courtroom or not because it took me, I had so many of them, and I had, they'll ask you um, each one, each charge. They'll ask you what you did, how you was feeling. It's like, ugh. Um, I didn't know if that time I was getting beaten or not. I didn't know why I was getting arrested. Um, so, yes. Um, can you please get with me so I can see if I can be there? <laughs> yes, because that's very important. And I would enlighten them, and maybe they would go a different way. It's very important for that because, you know what? I could see that I know I felt like that helped me. And it's empowerment. That's one, that's another empowerment point of that we go on. Um, thanks for asking that question. I haven't talked about this question in a while. I just have a quick question about, I'm over here. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. And I'm in the education world. But I have a question about what kept you going? What made you decide you're going to change? You want something? But what kept you going because you had to have sometimes of doubt and fear, and it's just easier to stop. People like you, I got tired of um, people kept saying I can make it and mean it. I got um, tired of um, getting beat up and y'all see me when you kept telling me I can help myself. I didn't believe in myself. You, um, with people not telling me what I was gonna do, you start asking me what would I like to do. Um, with people like you all that's sitting up here saying that there's a better way, without people like you telling me I'm a failure and saying that it's more to life. You treat me like I was a human being instead of an animal, instead of a prostitute, which I forget that um, I wasn't, I forget that I was human. I forgot I had rights. I forgot. Um, I can live on my own. I forgot all that because I was at the age of 35 being on drugs. I was told that I wasn't nothing and I got to believe in that in my head. So people like you um, help me. Let me get that one part. <laughs> <laughs> the one part. We have to always understand. Now, there's a difference between prostitution and human trafficking. But a lot of people don't see them. Okay, so that's it. Being a prostitute, you're going out there, you're doing what you want to do, you're selling yourself, and you're receiving what you want. You're receiving it. If you go out there and you say, hey, I need some cigarettes or whatever, whatever, and somebody seemed to pay for it, you're doing what you want. Now, if you go out there and somebody say, hey, mm, I'm going to give you some drugs, and you're a drug addict, and you're receiving what you want, you're still prostituting yourself. But if you go out there and get anything, and now they're not giving you what they say they're going to give you, or now they're holding you hostage, now they're making you do what they want you to do. Now you're being trafficked. Because now, if being a criminal, Lord, to make it easy, to make it better than this, is that one thing I learned being in jail so many times that I used to always wonder why, and I'm going to take you to eat and some butt because it's kind of hard. I used to always wonder why somebody get arrested for beating up somebody, but now they got um, kidnapping on them. So to enlighten you, what it means, if you jump on somebody and you, you beat them down to the ground, and if you pick them up and even push them or throw them to another space, you kidnap them. That's because you move them without their permission. So that's why it's called kidnapping. That's why it's called trafficking, because now I can't leave. You're sitting up here saying that you're going to give me something, but you're not giving it to me. You're threatening my family, and you're making me do things that I don't want to do. So that's, to, that's the difference between trafficking and prostitution. I had a young lady come to me and tell me that she wanted my help. She'd been trafficking, 
And I'm like, I'm like, oh God, I get uh, okay, okay. But when she came to me, she said she was trafficked because she went back out and she um, did the thing she did. And I said, okay, tell me some more. I said, well, was you beat up bad? She said, no. I said, so did you get your cigarettes? She said, yeah. I said, so what did you do? She said, I went back home. And I'm sorry to say this. I said, girl, you was being a hoe. <laughs> not being trafficked. And I went trying to be funny. It's not really funny, but I'm just telling you the difference between how we have to. We have to make the, the difference. And that's why we have to ask the questions because you can get played for doing what you want to do and being trafficked. So did I answer that question on that part? Okay, so here's the other part. Well, I just wanted to add a little bit onto that is I think another big key you asked about blurring the lines, I think education mm -hmm. is, is a huge part of that because so many women that I meet, generally women in, in what I do, is they would never use the words human trafficking. And a lot of people don't understand that it's more than money. You know, it's really anything of value that is the exchange. So yes, it's, it's often money. It can be drugs. And what I've been seeing a lot lately, sadly, I think since the pandemic, it's, it, it's escalated, is just a place to live. I'll be able to stay at your house if I, you know, do these things and whatnot. So that is, you know, something of value. And I think on the flip side of that is also familial trafficking. These kids don't realize that's what's happening to them, that they are being trafficked by their mom, dad, who, you know, uncle, whatever it may be. Sometimes they're born into this. I know many women on the street that they come into the house, mom and daughter, and it's just the life they live together and they don't really realize that's what's happening. Or if they're young enough, I'm 15, I have four younger siblings, they need to eat. So what am I gonna do? You know, I'm gonna do this because mom's out doing whatever she's doing. Or, so some of those things, you know, we're really working hard to provide some education to youth so they can be empowered and understand what this looks like. And some of the things they may be involved in is human trafficking. It's just, they don't understand that. So I think education is a huge part of it in all disciplines, truly. So I don't know if anybody has anything to add. Or go down the line. <laughs> I'll be brief, but I wanted to talk about guardianship real quick. So an adult under guardianship cannot consent. They cannot prostitute themselves. Therefore, they are prostituted. So if any of the health care providers here ever have a patient, an adult patient with legal guardianship, regardless of who um, they may be the ward of, please understand that. Thank you. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you all. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Like I so I think we're now like right at time. Um, I did want to just say one last final thing. And I just want to, again, thank our wonderful panelist speakers that are being here. Um, what Heather said about education, education is absolutely the key. And so you just by being here today, taking the time to be educated and to be open to learning about some of these difficult and challenging things, you are the hope. You are the hope. And it is our sincere hope that you will now go out and plant seeds. The one last final thing that I want to remind everyone is that if you are a student, because this is heavy content, if you are in need of counseling services, the BGSU Counseling Center is aware and available via phone call. And again, there are a wonderful wealth of national mental health hotlines that are toll free. So if anybody else in attendance needs a safe space to speak with someone, we strongly encourage you to do so. Thank you again. We appreciate you tremendously and your commitment to public work. Wonderful, wonderful. I need, I need to get with her.